Hey all, it was a privilege to be on the Kim Iverson show the other day and we had a great chat on farmer protests and much much more and basically like the title says why the world has gone nuts and I think we articulated it very well so I really hope you enjoy and the Kim Iverson show.com great place to go and sign up for all the full episodes. So we have a lot to talk about about uh, with things going on over there in Europe and in Ireland, the farmers' protests, the hate speech laws in Ireland. Um, things are kind of wild. I'm seeing that the farmers' protests are escalating. Lately in France, they've really uh, have been raging strong there, which I expect the French to always, you know, they, they really, the French and the Irish, I feel like the two of you guys <laughs> protest. And when you do, it's like real protesting, you know, it's not for the faint of heart. Um, but the, I mean, they, I, I watched the French protesters building a wall, like trying to blockade in their politicians. Uh, you know, they're just going crazy. Can you explain to us, we've seen the farmers protest spread throughout all of Europe now. What is the, and this, we saw the Netherlands, they, the farmers there were protesting a couple of years ago. So now it's ramped up. Can you explain kind of the backstory of how these protests got going? Why are they protesting? Yeah, sure, Kim. Well, in a nutshell, they're protesting because they're finally getting it, if you will. So I think there's a lot of awakening around the world since COVID, especially, and the climate stuff that's going on, and the trans and all that stuff. It's all connected to Agenda 2030, the UN goals, WEF, etc. So we know that. But the farmers are beginning to realize, like a lot of people, okay, this is an orchestrated campaign to kind of almost eliminate us and to replace local farming, healthy foods locally, uh, in, in local communities, to replace that with a kind of a massive pipeline of uh, ultra processed food from the big corporations. And you know, you will eat the bugs and all that nonsense. So mm -hmm. they actually realize now that it's not just the usual to and fro with governments, where the governments put in extra taxes and diesel taxes, et cetera, and they fight back a little, and then they get a bit of a kind of a, the backing off by the government. I think they know now because they're not accepting any of these little ploys to give them a break for 12 months. The farmers actually realize this is a, an end game of sorts and that now is the time to dig in and stand or there won't be anything to stand for. So yeah, Netherlands was nitrogen was the excuse used. Yeah. They used the nitrogen climate, you know, ecosystem stuff. Uh, if you look at the actual data for the Netherlands, they leveled off on their nitrogen in organic kind of rivers, et cetera, back in, I think, 2015. And it's slowly fallen and everything is kind of under control. But the government, of course, is using the nitrogen as an excuse to implement agendas and goals. Uh, climate is always just an excuse, if people keep that in mind. And in France, they've used other levies and taxes. And in Ireland, they're trying to suggest leaked memos from the department suggested they'd like to cull 200,000 cows. And now it wasn't an announcement or a stipulation. The fact checkers blowed on about that it was not actually an announcement, but it's irrelevant. It was all written down in department documents. That's what they want. So all of this climate nonsense is basically to disenfranchise farmers and all of us, but particularly mm -hmm. farmers. The goal is quite simple. It's to steadily remove and erode local uh, subsistence, local supply of food, and replace it with globalized international supplies of food. And in the same way, they don't want really a lot of local power generation from local resources. They've been eliminating all those in Ireland. They want the power to be kind of a weapon that you're dependent on the power grid. Electric cars are the same. The actual equation for the benefits of electric cars, if you take in the environmental impact of the, all the batteries and all the minerals, is absurd, right? Yeah. This has been said by senior members of even governments in various places. So the idea is to get people dependent on electrical supply, whereas locally provided or stored diesel gives people independence. So everything right. is moving towards remorselessly crushing uh, countries' sovereignty and their nationalist ideals and their local self-sufficiency and move towards the classic 15-minute city, you'll own nothing and be happy, and we'll provide your food and your power until 
you say something negative against the government. Right. And then we'll have to look again. Yeah, I mean, they have to figure out ways to control the people and the ways to control yeah. is certainly our livelihoods, certainly our ability to survive, right? And that's that's our money debanking people to cutting off food supply, cutting off power, cutting off communication. Um, and so gaining control over these things, you know, it, it w would be the way to do it. But the thing that is really interesting about Europe in particular and the current farming issue and the current issue around food is a couple, couple of things. First of all, um, I've lived in Europe a couple of times in France and in Italy. And the food there is very different than here in the United States. Here in the US, I think we get a lot of big corporate farming. We get all the GMOs and the food. We get all the modified stuff. And our food lasts a really long time. I could go to the grocery store here in the United States once every two weeks and the food just doesn't ever spoil. In Europe, when I was there, I had to go grocery shopping practically every day. The food spoils very quickly because it doesn't, it, it's not processed with and not enhanced with all of these various things that they do to our food here in the United States. It's probably also why Americans are bigger and fatter. I think the hormones and the, the stuff that they stick in our food versus Europeans. Um, and I say that because I, my family's from Vietnam. My cousins that were born here in the United States and raised here with both Vietnamese parents, I'm half white, but um, they're he like, my cousins are big. And I, I look at them and I'm like, there's no way genetically they're supposed to be this tall and big when they have these two tiny little Vietnamese parents, right? But so I think the food is hormone laden and all kinds of stuff here in the United States. I didn't really get that sense over in Europe. So it's interesting, first of all, I mean, I'm just curious, are the people in uh, throughout Europe, in the UK, in Ireland, are people concerned that moving in this direction, it's not, so just taking the farmers and their issues out of it just for a second, and their issues with not making, you know, they're barely holding on financially, and then these new policies are crushing them and all this. So taking that aside, are the people concerned that going to these big farming practices, corporate farming, global farming, that that is going to create food like the United States and start feeding it to you. I mean, that I, I, if I were European or anywhere on that continent, I would be like, no way. I do not want America. I mean, it tastes like when I came back, every time I'd come back after living periods of time in Europe and I'd come back to the United States, the food tastes like plastic hair. Yeah. I mean, it just isn't good. So are people concerned about that just from a, a basic person to person level? Yeah, I think the problem, Kim, is that the majority, sadly, and we saw it through COVID, they, they don't really think much. So critical thinking and analytics and analytical thinking in the last 40, 50 years, especially since the end of World War II, a few generations have passed and people have become kind of dumb. Now, of course, it takes 20,000 years in an evolutionary cycle to really change a species at all. So it's not like any of this obesity or this lack of critical thinking is in any way genetic. It's absolutely not. It's uh, societal and cultural. So people really don't think clearly. I'm in a low carb community, keto carnivore, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, hundreds of thousands of people worldwide. And we are highly focused on what you just said. But most normal people just assume the food will continue to be supplied. The supermarkets will still have food. They don't seem to connect the war on the farmers with actually a lower amount of high quality food. Amazing right. though that is. And essentially, I, I say with food, the simplest possible thing I can say after 10 years and thousands of published papers analyzed and the book we released in 2017, the simplest thing you can say is if you just eat meat, fish and eggs and kind of above ground vegetables that are not starchy, you know, like potatoes and all that kind of thing are very starchy, full of sugar. Uh, but if you just eat meat, fish and eggs and vegetables tomorrow morning, if that's all people ate, most of pharma would collapse within a few years, the pharma companies, because they're built on statins and antihypertensives, you know, anti blood pressure drugs that would just fall off the map if people could only eat meat, fish and eggs. And mm -hmm. then you can say, well, what's the real problem? The real problem is what you mentioned. It's ultra processed foods. They're long shelf life. They're internationalized. They've got amazing supply chains that make big food business, make a ton of money and they're junk. And British Medical Journal a few years ago looked and were shocked to see 
that under the category of ultra processed foods, which we know cause the modern chronic disease, diabetes type two, obesity, uh, Alzheimer's, which is, is now called diabetes type three, right? Because mm. it's diabetes off the, the neurological circuits. Wow. The BMJ found that over 60% of all calories consumed in the UK are from ultra processed foods. Mm. And Ireland's not much better and America's worse. And they contain what I call the devil's triad. So we keep it really simple for people. What is the root of the modern chronic disease epidemics? It's sugar, refined carbs, refined grains, and vegetable oils, the heart healthy mm. vegetable oils, which are the opposite. Those three components I call the devil's triad, they make up most of the calories in ultra processed food. And that's what makes the food bad, is the devil's triad. If you eliminate that triad, and you have to, of course, eliminate most of what's in the supermarket because it's all ultra processed, you're left with meat, fish and eggs and vegetables and what we ate, say, five to 10,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. And that's how simple it is. Now, I know we mentioned psychologically there's an addictive nature to this food. So it's not as simple as just flicking a switch because the temptation to eat the ultra processed stuff is enormous. And I know we, we wrote a chapter on that in our book, just the mm -hmm. psychology. It's tricky. Well, it's it's very addicting. Carbs are very addicting. Sugars are very addicting. Oils are very addicting, right? All of it is delicious and addicting. That's kind of the point of it. Um, so I, I'm I'm interested, though, that so point one with the, the farmers protest kind of circling back to this. The, the first thing is I'm curious why people in Europe aren't looking at the United States and saying, I don't want that. I don't want that kind of food. I don't, so we need to stick to I read a stat that I think in Europe, the farm, the family farms are still like 95% of the farms over there. I mean, it's still just a massive, massive number, which is why I feel like Europe is being targeted. The farmers yeah. are being targeted there. Here in the United States, we have a lot more corporate farming. So, and we're already really um, reliant on, on international food and, and, even inter and even just other countries owning our farmlands. Um, but in Europe, I think it's different. And, the, and so we're not seeing the uprising against on farmers here because they've already been attacked. They've already been obliterated. They're already barely hanging on here in the United States. And in Europe, there's a lot more of those family farms and it seems that they're now really massively under attack and trying to eliminate them by making it incredibly difficult to make a living as a farmer to where then uh, farmers just stop farming. I, I know I come from a, far a farming family my family owned farms forever. It was my my father sold the farm, but my grandfather, his father, ultimately worked on the farm for a while and then just decided, I can't farm anymore. This is just, it's too difficult. The, there's no real profit in it. And he became a trucker uh, rather than a farmer and kept the family farm going, but, you know, ran it out the farm. And and then my, and then my, my dad ultimately sold it. Um, but that's what happens in families now. Families are stopping the the farming is it's not it's no longer a business that's worth keeping in the family that is going to be beneficial for the family. It's a stress and it's a headache and it's hard more than anything. And that is, you know, th there, there's no profit in it. And, you know, my my family would tell me stories of how my grandparents would struggle as they were farming and my great grandparents would struggle. And they came from Denmark and they started the farm here. Um, so in Europe, it just seems like this is happening. I, I would think that the people are really upset about that. Secondly, what I find really interesting, but like you said, maybe they're just not thinking that way. They're not realizing they're going to end up with just a bunch of junk food if they go down this path, which they should be thinking ahead about. Um, the other thing I find interesting about this though, is why would the European leadership want to be reliant on global food production? when they have done everything they possibly can to cut off anything from Russia, for example. Like you go to war with a country and suddenly, uh, or, or you, you're backing a certain country in a war and suddenly you cut off the grain, you cut off like the, the fuel, or the gas lines, you cut off everything. I, I would think that the war, if anything, would have made people, and the pandemic, both of those combined, would make people realize we have to be reliant on ourselves. Isn't this odd that they're now wanting to shift to this global after being like, oh, and then we have to cut everything off and all the rates of, of you know, energy goes way up. And I mean, it just seems insane. 
it it does seem insane and that's what makes it hard for a lot of average people they know something seriously wrong as you describe but they can't quite put their finger on it and people have been programmed for decades to think of anything with high level power structures orchestrating the stuff people have been programmed to think of that as a conspiracy theory <laughs> and that they've done a great job on that so traditionally like 50 60 years ago i i often make this point uh, people were concerned and feared centralized power up top orchestrating their lives that was people's natural distrusting kind of feeling but now they've managed to make it that someone who actually distrusts the top level you call them a conspiracy theorist so people distrust the person who distrusts the top level right which is complete inversion it's insane but that's what they have and i interviewed professor richard verner who um about cbdc's which is yeah, a similar he's great. problem coming. he's great yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> great guy <laughs> real smart but he yeah oh he's great but he told me a couple of things and one of them is relevant to what you asked uh very much so so he told me something I wasn't fully aware of. He said, you know, the European system for the last 20, 30 years, and now it's heading straight to authoritarian insanity, as you described. Um, it's got like the European kind of commission, which is unelected, and they set all the rules and strategies. And they have a European parliament, which theoretically debates the laws, but they don't make the laws. And it's a talk shop. Now, he said, what is that an exact mirror of? And it's the Soviet system. Yeah. So Soviet Russia had the Politburo, the top party guys, and they decided what was going to happen. And there was a Soviet parliament that was a talk shop that allowed people to wrangle, but it had no power. So mm. he said one or two historians have actually called this out in papers that the EU has literally leveraged the Soviet centralized system uh, almost exactly. And that's the answer to the question. It's quite simple. The EU Commission at the top is now fully invested with the UN, the WEF, and all the other groups like Club of Rome and Trilateral Commission, yada, 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 all the way back to the US State Department, which pulls a lot of strings. And they are doing what the top strata believe is best for the planet, and for them, of course, but, but for the planet. So ordinary people are just stupid in their mind, Ordinary politicians locally and nationally are just idiots who are only looking at the next election cycle. So they at the top truly believe the world needs to be managed. And that means slowing down the use of resources, guarding all the resources for the future, and of course, bringing in an ant farm, as my daughter called it, bring in a totalitarian system where people feel that they're kind of free and Western. You keep them under that illusion. But the reality is everywhere you turn, it's a centralized economy run from the top. Hence, yeah. we see all this madness. So it makes no sense, of course, as you described in these troubled times to take away local sovereign sources of energy and food. It's it's catastrophic. Right. But it does fit the plan and the strategy of, of Agenda 2030, which is being rolled out. It fits perfectly. So there you have it, folks, KimIversonShow.com. And I put the link down below to go and get the full episode and other fantastic interviews and content uh, with Kim. So superb stuff. And as always, huge thanks to my Patreon and PayPal supporters. That's what keeps the show on the road, gets me out there on all the different shows, doing the research, giving the talks, and all the other work that's involved in getting the truth out in a world that's full of lies. So thank you so much.